Last thing in your notes. What were we chatting about? What's the last thing you wrote down? Oh, okay, so we were probably talking about equalizers, yeah. is what I would guess. Isolating a group of frequencies. Yeah, okay, cool. So I'll, I'll start with that. So I imagine that I had a sort of larger diagram of a particular fader strip, right? Like one fader strip. Okay, so let me draw that. We'll go back to the large fader strip. And as I recall, down here at the bottom, we would have had a fader knob, right? A fader knob at the bottom of the fader strip. At the tippy top, we had what? What's that thing? Gain. Gain, right? And what's a gain knob do? What's gain do? Well, kind of. It changes the voltage of the input signal strength. Okay, so it's what we call a pre-fade adjustment. So no matter where this particular knob is, all right, the fader knob at the bottom, this is adjusting incoming signal strength, all right, because we have to balance everything out. Did I talk about mic and line sources? Yeah, that mic sources are kind of low and line sources are kind of strong, right? And so we need to adjust all that and balance everything out before we begin the show. And the way we do that is by using that gain knob. Then I probably mentioned uh, that you would have a button sometimes says plus 48 volts, phantom power, right? And phantom power can supply power to a capacitor microphone that normally runs on batteries. But if you've got phantom power, you can take the batteries out and just use phantom power and then you don't have to worry about a battery going dead in the middle of a show. Yes, no blink. Uh, and then I probably said something about we were on the EQ part, right? And I think I probably defined equalizer. An equalizer isolates a group of frequencies and then either boosts or reduces the response to those frequencies. Yeah, uh, and so the last diagram I probably would have had is something like this, 20,000 hertz, also called 20K, down to about 20 hertz, that's the range of human hearing, right? And so if you have a three channel equalizer, you're gonna divide that into what? Three groups. Does that make sense? So in your car, in your car, you have bass and treble. You have bass and treble adjustments. You ever messed around with that? Increase the bass a little bit. Yeah, okay. Well, in your car, you're dividing this frequency range into two groups, bass and treble, yeah? But on this particular model, you're doing what? You're dividing it into three groups, Base, middle ranges, and high ranges, or just simply high, middle, low. Do you follow that idea? And then I probably mentioned something to the effect of, you know, uh, digital equalizers that are PC based can actually isolate and boost or reduce every single frequency 20 hertz, 21 hertz, 22 hertz. Did I mention that? Yeah, okay, good. All right, so. Uh, what else will you have on here? What else will you have on here? Did I mention the cut switch or mute switch? Okay. A cut switch or a mute switch, cut, mute, uh, sometimes it's just on off, all right? A cut switch or a mute switch uh, will literally deactivate the entire fader strip, all right? It will deactivate the entire fader strip or activate the fader strip. So in a live production, that's often used to cut someone's microphone off before they drop the F-bomb. 
Okay, so you know, you're doing Jerry Springer, uh, you've got a guest on the show who's about to find out that his wife's been having sex with his brother, right? You did what, you son of a bitch, mother? Well, rather than grabbing the fader knob and slowly fading down, you can just do what? Pop them off. You can just hit the cut switch. Does that make sense? But another reason for that cut switch is that you can preset your levels. You can preset your fader knob at a certain spot. So if you know that my voice is going to be registering minus 20 dB at a certain position, right? You can just leave the fader knob there, and then when it's my turn to talk, you can do what? Turn me on, let me do my thing, and then do what? Turn me off. Does that make sense? Uh, cut switches are also uh, quite helpful if you have talent and they start coughing or something like that, or sneezing, or they're having some sort of difficulty. <laughs> you can, without grabbing the fader knob, you can just simply cut them out. All right. Uh, another knob that you probably will have uh, sometimes, a good way to think about it is balance. How many of you have messed with balance in your car, left and right? Okay, you can make all the sound come out of the left side, you can make all the sound come out of the right side. But that's called pan. That's called pan. Uh, and what pan will do is take this audio source, whatever it is, let's say it's microphone number one, it'll take that audio source and shove it down one side of the output or the other. Do you remember that audio program is stereo? You remember that? Audio program is two lines, okay? Well, you might, for some reason, you might want to isolate microphone number one on a particular side of the output line. So if this is audio program and this is channel one, this is channel two, left and right, if you grab that pan knob and you turn it all the way to the left, microphone one will be isolated on channel one. Does that make sense? If you turn it the other way, it would isolate it here. So in some productions, what we do is we isolate the microphones on one channel, and then we isolate music or playback audio on the other channel. Does that make sense? So that you have individual control. So your reporter narration, uh, hi, I'm Andrew Rutterback, I'm live here at the scene of whatever something happened earlier today, blah, blah, blah. That microphone might be isolated onto channel one, and then your natural sound, birds chirping, fire trucks going by, whatever, you could isolate that on channel two by using your pan controls. Does that make sense? Nine times out of 10 though, uh, what you're gonna be doing is you just leave your pan control just right in the middle, and so it's going to take microphone one, split it, and send it down both sides. Do you follow that idea? It's just gonna split it, duplicate it, and send it down both sides evenly so that my wonderful voice would be coming out of both speakers at the same time. All right? Another common uh, button that you see on a fader strip is labeled solo. 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 And solo is very, very, very useful uh, to the audio operator. Uh, it's very useful in, when you're trying to identify a problem. So, Let's say, for example, that you have, oh, let's say eight microphones hooked up. You've got eight people, and they're all in here arguing about politics or something. So you've got eight separate microphones. But you're listening in your headphones. You're listening to what? All eight. Does that make sense? You're listening to audio program. That's what you're really monitoring in your headphones. And then let's say you hear something like a little bit of static or there's something wrong. There's some hum uh, or some other type of noise in the signal. Well, and you're trying to figure out which microphone it is. Is it microphone one? Is it mic two, mic three, mic four, mic five, 
six, seven, or eight. Which one is it? Well, if you're listening to audio program, it's impossible to tell which one has the problem. Well, solo will allow you to listen to one particular source without affecting the final mix. Everybody at home is still listening to all eight, but you, with your headphones, you're listening to what? Just this one mic. Does that make sense? So you can just pop that solo button. Everybody at home is still listening to the whole mix, all right? But when you hit that solo button, you are listening to just, in this example, microphone one. And you can go, okay, microphone one, that's fine. Microphone two, that's fine. Microphone three, oh, something wrong with mic microphone three. Maybe it's a battery going dead, maybe it's a bad cable, what have you. Now imagine this if you're dealing with not just eight microphones, but you're dealing with, say, oh, I don't know, 40 or 50 microphones, right? Maybe you're doing a choir or an orchestra or something like that, and you're trying to figure out which one. Think about how valuable solo would be. Make sense? All right, now. It's not uncommon, it's not uncommon nowadays, when you look at an audio board, all of a sudden, a lot of these knobs, a lot of knobs are gone. They're all gone. They're not there. There's no knobs. You know, you might have a few little switches. You might have a few little switches, uh, but for the most part, the fader strip is really, really, really clean. It's a really clean looking fader strip. Did all of those functions just vanish? Are they no longer available to you? No. What they're going to do nowadays is this. They figured out that it's cheaper, it's cheaper to make a common control interface. A common control interface. A common control interface. Now the manufacturers call these things different names, all right? But a common control interface is really pretty cool. What often what it is is on your audio board, if I go back to the audio board uh, you know square, remember you've got your fader strips and whatnot. Oftentimes, sort of in the middle, what you'll have is uh, this common control interface. Sometimes there's a little LCD screen, all right, like a little LCD screen, okay. Uh, sometimes that LCD screen may be sort of up in the corner, or maybe it's even separate, okay, maybe it's even separate. But what you'll see on the fader strip is a select A select switch. All right, a select switch. And if you punch the select switch, you are selecting this fader into the common control interface. And then inside the common control interface, you will find your equalizer, uh, you'll find output assignments, you'll find pan you'll find all kinds of different things, all right? But rather than having to replicate it a hundred jillion times, they just do a select switch, and then you go to the common control interface, and you can make adjustments. Do you follow that idea? And then if you want to make another adjustment on a different fader, you hit select, and it's going to do what? It's going to pop into this common control interface. Does that make sense? Uh, so some audio boards are going to have a hundred jillion knobs and buttons. Some will appear to be very clean, but you'll see these select buttons. And if you see a select button, you just go, oh, this audio board has a common control interface. Does that make sense? And it's just a different way of making adjustments to the equalizer, uh, to pan adjustments, to solo, or what have you. Uh, 
often it's really quite nice because some of them nowadays are even touch screen. So you just punch select and then you just do, 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 do. makes it very easy. Yes, no? Yeah, all right, cool. Any questions about basics on the fader strips? Now I'm going to make things a bit more complicated. I'm going to go back to the audio board drawing. So here's our audio board. And you'll recall that we have all these incoming streams of audio. Some are mono, some are stereo, and they're labeled for you. Yeah. And then we have this outgoing river. It's a two-channel river, right? Stereo. That's called audio program. Those are the basics you have to remember. But here's where it gets more complicated. Audio program is not the only output. Audio program is not the only output. There are auxiliary, auxiliary and sub outputs. Auxiliary and sub outputs. All right. Now, a lot of times, an auxiliary output is a dedicated line that's going to a particular location. So, for example, all right, we might want to take the output of the audio board and run it to the dressing room. Okay, to the dressing room. Sometimes they call that the green room in theater, right? Uh, but you might want to have a dedicated line that goes to the dressing room so that people in the dressing room can hear what's going on. Do you follow that idea? Or maybe there's a dedicated output line that goes into my office because I'm the executive producer. Do you follow that idea? Well, that's very basic, okay? But do you remember we talked a little bit about that funny thing in the anchor's ear? Little, little ear phone with a little curly Q deal coming off of it. Does anybody remember what that's called? IFB. IFB. IFB is also a dedicated output. Okay, IFB is a dedicated uh, output. IFB. It's a dedicated output. And so the anchors, the talent, can actually hear audio program. They can hear audio program. Uh, and uh, if they're using a mix minus system, they're hearing audio program without the, their microphone. If they're not using mix minus, they're hearing audio program including their microphone. So they can actually hear themselves. Does that make sense? But the thing about IFB, it's interrupt fold back or sometimes interrupt feedback. The, the key idea here is that it can be interrupted. By who? Who can interrupt it? Well, not really the director. Who's going to want to talk to the talent maybe directly? A producer, right? A producer has the ability in the control room, there's a microphone with a switch, all right? It's a switched microphone. And the producer can hit that switch. All of a sudden, program goes away, and you've got the producer talking straight into your ear. Can you imagine trying to be sitting up here live with someone? You're trying to read a script, and you've got a producer talking to you? OK? But the producer's not going to do that unless there's something important. Click, we've got breaking news out of Hartford. The governor's just been shot. Uh, get ready to pitch to uh, John Smith downtown. They finished their story. Uh, we've got breaking news out of Hartford. We understand the governor's just been shot. We're going to go live now to John Smith downtown. John, does that make sense? Uh, how many of you have seen video of September 11th, the attacks and whatnot? Well, the anchors didn't have scripts in front of them. There was. I mean, they were literally put on the air with no scripts. And so the producers were feeding them information. Does that make sense? Through that IFB. Uh, there's another airplane that just hit the Pentagon. Uh, we understand that another aircraft has just hit the Pentagon. Does that make sense? And so IFB is very valuable in
breaking news situations, uh, situations where you need to change what's happening very, very quickly. All right. And so you might have a, a, a host or somebody that's doing a baseball game or a football game or something like that. And you can actually talk to them and say, hey, listen, you know, we need to go to commercial break right now. Uh, and we'll be right back after these messages. Make sense? And so it's a way for the producers to interact. But that's one of these auxiliary or sub outputs. Does that make sense? Now, let me give you a different example of what a sub can do for you. Uh, besides being dedicated outputs, what we can do is we can group, group common inputs together. We can group common inputs together. This is kind of cool. And then we can control them with one fader strip. So let's say you've got four microphones. All right. Let's say you got four microphones. Mic one, mic two, mic three, mic four. All right. Well, down here in my subs, what I can do is I can grab those four mics. One, two, three, four. I can grab those four microphones, combine them, combine them, and bring them back in as a new input. Now I can control all four of those mics with one fader strip. Does that make sense? I have grouped control. I have grouped control. Do I still have individual control? Yes, I do. Right? If you think about it, okay, you've got mic one, mic two, mic three, and mic four. You've got your four fader strips. That's your individual control, right? Mic one, two, three, and four. It's just on the downstream side, I'm taking the output of those four, I'm grouping them back together again, and zipping them back through, and now this one is really one, two, three, and four. I still have individual control, but I, now I also have grouped control. Do you see how this might be valuable if you were doing an orchestra and every single instrument had their own microphone, which is kind of rare, but let's say that that happened, okay? I could control all the violins by grouping. I could control the violins with one. I could control the trumpets with one. Do you follow that grouping idea? The other thing that these feedback loops can do for you, the, this idea of looping backwards, let's say you want to do apply a special effect. Well, you know, uh, maybe Oprah has a cold, all right, and I really want to apply some more advanced special effects. I can take Oprah's microphone, bring it back around, shove it through a special effects box. Whoops. And now I have Oprah's microphone clean. And then I have my Oprah's microphone with special effects. Do you follow this looping idea? These are more advanced concepts. So if you're a bit confused, don't worry about it. All right? What I expect you to remember for the midterm is, you know, streams of audio coming in, one river going out. Makes sense? All right. But you can do endless looping like this. You can do endless looping, endless looping. All right. Um, questions? Questions? The reason endless looping is kind of fun is that you can do multi-tracking. Does anybody know what, know what multi-tracking is? Well, let me give you an example. How many of you uh, have ever gone to a concert? Ever. And you're in your car and you're driving to the concert and you're listening to a CD or something of that artist? And you're getting all jazzed up, you and your friends, to, you're going down to Mohegan Sun to see something or uh, and, and you get to the concert, and you get to the concert, and the concert doesn't really sound as good as what you were just listening to in your car, 
right? You're, you're kind of like, this doesn't sound as good as what I already own. I mean, come on, be honest. You've gone to live shows where you're sort of like, that's not all that, I just spent, but you drink a beer, you buy the t-shirt anyway, right? But you're sort of disappointed, you know, you're, you're kind of disappointed. You're like, well, they're not so good live. You're not so good live. Well, let me explain something. What you're listening to in your car is a highly produced piece of music, all right? Taylor Swift is a good singer, but she's not fantastic, all right? Miley Ray is a good singer, but she's not fantastic. Do you know how you make them fantastic? Multi-tracking. Taylor sings a song from beginning to end. Then we rewind it, and she sings it again. We rewind both of those, and she does what? Sings it again. Rewind those, sing it again. Now, how many Taylors do we have? It sounds like you have four Taylor Swifts sing, singing at the same time. And so the characteristic of the audio, it's very full, deep. Sounds great. Does that make sense? You ever wonder how somebody can sing their own harmonies? Ever? You ever been listening to a piece of music and you're listening to, to the singer and they're singing their own harmonies? It's impossible. You cannot do that physically. Does that make sense? So multi-tracking allows these artists to create these very, very awesome pieces of music, and that's what you're listening to in the car. But when you get to Mohegan Sun, what are you listening to? One mic. Does that make sense? You're listening to one mic. Yes, no, blank? Okay. Now, how many of you have done this exact same thing and you get to the concert and the concert's awesome? I mean, it's awesome, it's great. I mean, there's blinky lights, there's lasers, and it sounds every bit as good as what you have in your car. In fact, it's better. And you're like, man, that was awesome. I'll never forget this night ever. That was the best concert, anybody? Come on. Of course. Well, guess what? You just paid 80 bucks to listen to the music that you already own. What? They were lip syncing? Oh, no, no, no. They're not lip syncing. Their microphone's live. They're just also doing what? They're singing along with pre-recorded material. Does that make sense? Their microphone is live. But they're adding in pre-recorded multi-tracks so that it sounds as good as the CD that you already have. Or, if you're not going to do that, how many backup singers do you bring? Like, a lot, right? You fill the entire back of the stage with backup singers, and now it's going to sound as good as what you already did. Do you follow that idea? You know, how many of you have ever been to a concert and the lead singer is running around and jumping around and dancing a lot? How many of you have ever tried to sing and dance at the same time? What's it sound like? <sighs> right? It's not easy to sing and dance at the same time, at least not very Rig rigorously or vigorously, that's the word I'm looking for. So what they do in those situations is they turn the microphones on and off at predetermined times. All right? So I got a mic in my hand and I'm dancing around on the stage and I'm dancing around on the stage and I'm dancing around on the stage and they turn my mic on and I stop and I go, hey Hartford! They shut it off. I do some more dance and I do some more dance and do some more dance and they turn the mic on Hoo! Turn the mic off. Dance, dance, dance. No one can sing and dance at the same time. Not even the great Michael Jackson could do it. No kidding. 
all right? Otherwise, you'd hear what? If their mic was on all the time, you'd hear, <sighs> make sense? Okay, so there's lots of ways to get around it. There's lots of ways to get around it. And occasionally in live programming, yeah, they lip sync. You know, if their voice is shot for whatever reason, they will lip sync. Can anybody give me an example of someone who's ever done that? Anybody give me an example of someone who has lip synced on live TV? Also happens to be blonde. Britney Spears. Britney Spears is the queen of lip sync. The I mean, seriously, if you really watch some of her stuff, you're like, that's off. Your mouth isn't quite the same as what I'm hearing. Make sense? Oh, no, her microphone was live. Click. Hey, Hartford. Click. All right. Um, Questions about basic audio. Questions about basic audio at this point. Ba this is basic audio. Most audio in television is low process audio. It's garbage in, garbage out. We don't spend a lot of time with equalizers or special effects and whatnot. It's just garbage in, garbage out. Uh, in radio, in sound recording, then you're going to be doing a lot of higher end processing of the audio signal. In advertising, you do a lot of higher end uh, audio processing. Uh, but for most live TV, it's just you hook up the mics and you go. Does that make sense? All right. Last chance on questions for audio board. There's a whole nother audio lecture coming later. All right, so let's switch gears and we're going to talk about video switchers. We're going to talk about video switchers. That's the other most complex machine in the control room is the video switcher. The video switcher is a box, just like that audio board. It's a box, all right? It's a box, a magic box. But video does not flow and mix like water. Video does not flow and mix like water. So we can't use that idea of streams and lakes and dams and things. That doesn't work for video, okay? Uh, but the design is kind of the same, so let's go with that. What you have are video sources that are wired in, video sources that are wired into the video switcher. So these are video inputs, video inputs, okay, video inputs. Now the nice thing about video is that it's not, you don't have to worry about stereo, <laughs> okay. Uh, a video source is generally one line. It's one line. Although some devices can generate two lines, they're separate lines. They're not to be used at the same time in parallel. Okay. So give me an example. Well, what's a video source? Okay, you got your cameras, right? Camera one, camera two, camera three. Camera one, camera two, camera three. Give me another video source. DVD. What? Okay, some type of playback device. A playback device is going to be playing back pre-recorded material, right? And it might be a VTR, it might be a DVD player, it might be a DDR, it might be a video server of some kind. So I'll just put DDR A, DDR B. The reason we letter them as opposed to DDR1, DDR2, DDR3, we don't want to confuse the playback devices with the cameras. The cameras are numbered, playback devices are typically lettered. You use letters to identify them so that when the director's running off at the mouth, you don't get confused about what the director is talking about. All right. What else is video? What else? Give me another input. Okay, a matrix is simply a, an interface with a server, okay? 
So yeah, a server, all right, a video server of some kind, but a matrix unit, that's what it is. It's, it's an interface. What else? Yeah. Okay, yeah, your graphics computer. I'll just do FX on that. What else? I'm live in Afghanistan. The video signals being encoded, shot through outer space off of the a satellite. Uh, I'm live in downtown Hartford. Little truck, little pole. Microwave truck, MX. All right. So these are wired in. These are wired in. Okay. These are all wired in. And it depends on how many outside sources you have as to how big your audio or your uh, video switcher is going to be. All right. So if you need to be able to handle multiple satellites, multiple microwaves, multiple DDRs, you're going to get what? More buttons. Right. You're going to get more buttons. Do you follow that idea? Okay. Flowing out, though, coming out is a single line of video. Coming out the other side is a single line of video. And this is what everybody at home is looking at. It's the video signal that's hot, live, being recorded, and it's called video program. Video program. That is the output of the video switcher. The output of the video switcher is video program. So when you're at home watching TV, you are watching video program and you are listening to audio program. Make sense? But they're coming out of different machines. They're coming out of different machines. And then they are being recombined as they go out and into your house. Well, okay, so what does the video switcher itself do? Well, it's a video selection device. And nine times out of ten, you know what you're doing? You are simply selecting one of these. You are simply selecting one of these and allowing it to do what? pass through to video program. So that's what the box does. You find the button labeled camera one, click, and it goes out on program. So it's a very basic machine at its most basic level. Uh-oh, I'm going to hit the button that says DDRA, click DDRA, whatever's in there. The output of DDRA is now flowing through in its video program. Yeah? So what it means to me, Chad, is it has two different video switches, one in New York, one that's in the interview in New York, and some one's in Chicago? Satellite one, satellite two. Okay, so you can put those both through and they'll come out just on the same screen? No, I'm, I, I, in the example I'm doing right now, the example I'm doing right now, if I just, I can do either New York or Chicago. If you want to do both at the same time, that's a special effect. Okay? And we're going to talk about that. How do you combine video signals? All right? How do you combine them? Does that make sense? So... In this example so far, we're just looking at one thing at a time. And I know that's boring, but you got to start somewhere. All right? Everybody clear on this concept? So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw the video switcher really big. Ready? Sure, Dr. Ederback. Come on, it's 11 o'clock. The coffee should have kicked in by now. Wake up! Or is the coffee wearing off? Is that what it is? All right, guys. So if you look at a video switcher really big, the lower 
left hand side, the lower left, and I don't care who built the switcher, I don't care if it's Sony, Grass Valley, or anybody else, the lower left is important, all right? What you're going to see are at least two rows of buttons, but usually three. And so let's draw three rows of buttons. And let's draw one, two, three, four, we, we, five is plenty. So you're going to have at least two rows, but a lot of times you'll have three, okay? And I'm going to redraw this so that it's not quite so large. I'm just going to kind of do this, all right? This piece of the video switcher is called an ME. M slash E. It's called an ME bus. That's the complete name. An ME bus. An ME bus. A group of two or three rows of buttons is an ME bus. Mix effects bus. Mix, M-I-X. Mix effects bus. All right? So a group of two or three. On professional models, listen, it's always going to be three. All right? On lower end models, you might get two. But listen, three, that's going to be more than norm. All right? So the whole thing's called a mix effects, mix effects bus. The bottom row is called the preview bus. This row here is the preview bus. The middle row is called the program bus. Program bus. So a row of buttons is called a what? A bus. All right. A group of buttons is called a bus. But, guys, in layman's terms, it's a row of buttons, okay? The top row is called the key bus. Key bus, all right? Preview bus, program bus, key bus. Now, what you're going to notice when you really look at an ME bus is that each button, and if you're from New Britain, it's button, each button is labeled, and it's going to look something like this. The labeling is consistent from top to bottom. Watch this. One, one, one. Two, two, two. Three, three, three. A, A, A. B, B, B. What do you think one is? What do you think two is? So what's A? Probably a playback device, right? Probably a DDR, a VTR, or something like that? Yeah? Making sense? All right, so when we were in the control room, I showed you two TV sets, right? There were two monitors right above the video switcher. One of them was labeled preview. One of them was labeled program. Do you remember that? Remember membering that part? So I'm going to have to get this a little smaller. But you have a monitor. <clears throat> the one on the left is preview. The one on the right is program. Now remind me, what's program? 
Let's program. Yeah, the video signal that is live, hot, being recorded, the one that everybody at home is looking at, right? What's preview? Bingo. The video signal that is on deck or next. And in fact, no one at home can see it. The only people that can see preview are in that room. Does that make sense? All right. So let's take a wild guess what's going to happen. I'm going to press, you ready? This is so impossibly difficult. I'm going to press number one in the program bus. What do you think is going to happen? Camera one's going to go bing. Now everybody at home is looking at what? Camera one. I'm going to take my finger. In the program bus, I'm going to hit camera two. What's going to happen? Camera one disappears. Camera two pops in there. Now everybody at home is looking at what? Camera two. Uh-oh, I'm going to hit camera three. Two disappears. Three pops in. Does that make sense? OK. That's what the program bus does. All right, it is selecting video sources to program. So what do you think the preview bus does? The same exact thing. Okay, so I'm gonna hit camera two in the preview bus. Two is here. Uh, I'm gonna put camera three in the program bus. All right, so everybody at home's looking at three and I am previewing two. I'm previewing two. Does that make sense? Now, quick question. How can I get two to move into program? How can I get two to move into program? The most basic way to do it is to do what? Seek it. Well, yeah, but how? The, tell me what button to press. I want to get two into program. What should I do? OK. On its most basic level, the fastest way to do it would be just to do what? Punch number two in the program bus. Three disappears, and two is here. And since I hit two in preview, it's still there. So I'm just looking at two and two screens. All right? But listen. In the middle of a live production, do you think it's smart to actually touch the program bus? In the middle of a live production, if you hit the wrong button in the program bus, everybody at home is going to instantaneously see it. Does that make sense? So during a TV show, I know this is going to sound crazy. During a TV show, we don't touch the program bus. Before the show, who cares? After the show, who cares? During the show, you don't touch the program bus. In fact, it lights up red. It's trying to tell you. The machine is going, don't touch me. Don't touch me. In fact, it would be great if they would wire in little electric shocks, okay, or something like that. But so you may say, well, Dr. Ederbeck, how then do you get, if camera three is here, how do you get two into program without touching the program bus? Well, that's part of what you're paying for when you pay for a video switcher. There are three possible ways to do it. Three possible transitions. That's what these are called, transitions. There's three ways to do it. All right, the three transitions are the cut, the wipe, and the dissolve. The cut, the wipe, and the dissolve. The cut, the wipe, and the dissolve. And so, Right next to your ME bus, 
right next to the ME bus, guess what? <laughs> You're going to see a button <laughs> labeled cut. All right, and oftentimes they actually identify it. They say transitions or trans or something like that. It's the transition area of the video switcher. All right, so if I hit the cut switch right now, what will happen? Camera two will instantly pop into program. So I'm going to hit the cut switch. You ready? Click. Two pops into program, three flops back to preview. This is called flip flop switching. Flip flop. Flip flop switching. Whatever was in program simply falls back or flops back into preview. Okay? Now, everybody at home is looking at what? Camera two, all right? Before I hit the cut switch again, maybe the next thing I want, instead of three, maybe I want camera one, okay? What do I, what should I do? I want to put one in preview. What should I do? Yeah, I'm just going to go to my preview bus. I'm going to hit camera one. Three just kind of goes away. Camera one's now in preview, okay? Camera one's now in preview. Who can see preview? Just us, <laughs> right? Just us. Everybody at home still looking at two? Yeah? Now I'm going to hit the cut switch and what's going to happen? Yeah, I hit the cut switch. Two flops into preview and one goes hot into program. Make sense? So cuts are very basic. And by the way, a cut is an instantaneous transition. It's instant. And a cut is the most common transition in film and television and video. It's not very special. It's not fancy. There's no blinky lights. You just hit the cut switch. Makes sense? But it's very basic. So, also in the transition area, you'll see a button labeled auto, auto, auto is short for automatic. That's magic, automatic is magic. And then typically above that, so I'm going to have to erase this part, above that or nearby the auto switch you'll see two buttons. What are those other two transitions? We got the cut, the wipe. wipe. All right, so one of them is going to be labeled wipe. The other one's going to be labeled, dissolve. well, dissolve is too long to fit on the button. So I need a word. Sure. I need a word for dissolve that'll fit on the button. So they, you know what they use? Mix. Seriously, that's an engineer someplace in California going, I can't fit dissolve on the button. I'll call it a mix. I'm not kidding. Half of this stuff is by accident. Half of it's engineering. But All right, now, I want to activate a wipe. So I want to get camera two onto program. I don't want to cut this time. I want to wipe it on. Okay, now, as you guys know, because you've played around with things like PowerPoint and whatnot, how many different wipes are there? Like 300 billion wipes, okay? You can have a wipe that goes from left to right, from right to left, top down, bottom up. You can have a circle, a star, the Batman wipe. You know what I'm talking about? There's like a hundred scrillion of these things. Okay, you could have a square, you could have a triangle. So you're gonna have to pick 
your wipe pattern. You're going to have to pick a wipe pattern. Maybe it'll be just very basic, left to right. Okay. But to activate the wipe, to activate the wipe, the first thing you have to do is you have to tell the machine that you want a wipe. So I'm going to press the wipe switch right here. I'm going to press it. Nothing happens. Two is still there. One is still there. Nothing has happened. All I have done is told the machine the effect that I want. I have not activated the effect. I have simply preset the effect. Does that make sense? If I want to activate the effect, how would you go about that? Take a wild guess. Hit the auto switch. And when you hit the auto switch, the effect will activate. Camera 2 will wipe onto program. You ready? I'll do the wipe for you. Ready? Wipe. And whatever was in program simply flops back into preview. Make sense? Okay, so let's say you want to dissolve. You want to dissolve one onto program. How do you do it? You hit mix. Nothing happens. All you did was what? Preset. Yeah, it's a preset. You just told the machine, hey, this is the effect that I want. But now it's time to activate it. You hit auto, and what's going to happen? Two is going to fade away as one fades in. Does that make sense? So I hit the auto switch. Two fades away. One fades in. Two winds up back in preview. The nice thing about flip-flop switching, so let's go back to the, oh, any questions about the transitions, the cut, the wipe, or the dissolve? Yeah. When would you pick the pattern to wipe? Would you hit wipe, pattern, and then hit auto? I would probably do pattern wipe auto. But the pattern, normally if I'm going to be using wipes, I have already preset the wipe in pre-production, like an hour before the show. So you typically use the same wipe. Yeah, I'm going to go, OK, I'm going to use this one. And in fact, you can reset them. You can go wipe one, wipe two. Does that make sense? And so you can have some preset patterns if there's a certain set of patterns that you like to use. But here's the deal, guys. Just because you can do a wipe doesn't necessarily mean it's a good idea. Just because you can have spinning purple star wipes does not necessarily mean it's a good idea. Okay? What's the most common transition? A cut. Okay? And I'll show you when we do our demo just how ridiculous it can get. All right? Because it can. Yeah? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, you don't want to hit the wrong button. So it's better to bring something into preview, take a look at it, make any minor corrections, and then hit that cut switch. All right? It gives you, and I know it's getting hot in here, guys. Sorry about it. Uh, it gives you a split second to make corrections. Oh, camera two, you're out of focus. Set your focus. Camera three, you know, can you move a little to the left? Pan left, pan left. Makes sense. It gives you a split second to make a correction. All right, but flip-flop switching is really cool. Let's say you've got two people arguing. All right, let's say you've got two people arguing. Camera one is Donald Trump. So Trump's in program. How appropriate. All right. Camera two is Hillary. And they're arguing. Do I have to even bother with the preview anymore? 
I just have my hand on the cut switch. Well, I think you're lame. Click. Well, I don't like you either. Click. Oh, yeah? Click. Yeah. Click. Yeah. Does that make sense? You can just sit there and go. Can somebody bring me a latte? You know, does that make sense? So that's the nice thing is when you're using two sources a lot, you don't have to keep messing with it. You can just keep popping the cut switch, especially in something that's very, very fast or very active. And sometimes debates can be that way. They, they can be that way, all right? Or you're just doing an interview show. You're doing an interview show and it's Oprah and Lance Armstrong and you can just sit there and go, well, you know, Oprah's talking, click. Lance is about to talk, he's about to talk, click. Yeah? What if you want the whole stem of the final screen? That's a special effect. And we're going to get to that. That's what he was talking about earlier. How do you get two video sources on screen at the same time? Okay. So let's walk before we run. All right. For now, we're just doing what? Preview program key and then the transitions. Yeah. Aha. Another advanced thing. Okay, so you ready for the advanced stuff? How do you combine video images so that you can look at more than one video source at the same time? How can you combine video images so that you can look at more than one thing at the same time? Well, let's get into it just a little bit in the time that we have today. Combining video. All right. The first way that you can combine video sources is really easy. You activate a wipe and you stop it halfway through. All right, so you can wipe if this is your TV set, we've got a wipe and we've stopped the wipe halfway through the screen. All right. In preview, I've got camera one. In program, I've got camera two. Boom, boom. Make sense? So, but here's the deal you are looking at camera one. 100% power, camera two, 100% power. So it's a nice clear video image, but you're only looking at half the acquisition screen. Does that make sense? So if I've got a camera, right, my camera image is my entire frame the entire frame. If I want to put him on one side of the frame, I have to do what? Move it like this. This side's being cut off. So we're not going to see you at all. Sorry. We're cutting him off. His image is going to appear right there. I'm going to do the same thing for you. I'm going to push it over like this, right? Your image is going to appear there. He's in my frame, but he's being what? Blocked out. Does that make sense? That's one way that you can combine video images. And it can be any video. Satellite one, satellite two. Camera one, satellite one. Microwave two, satellite five. Graphics computer, camera three. Yeah. How do you stop the wipe halfway through? Oh. How do you stop the wipe halfway through? Because if you hit that auto switch, it's going to do what? It's going to go all the way through. So there must be some way that you can do it. You're going to love it. On the video switcher, there's a, a T-bar handle. There's a T-bar handle. 
which allows you to activate dissolves and wipes by hand. Okay? It allows you to activate wipes and dissolves by hand. It's a little T-bar. Some people call it a fader bar. But what's really cool about it is that you can push on it and then just take it up about halfway through and let go. Does that make sense? You know what's really cool about the fader bar? Do you know what the most awesome thing about a Grass Valley switcher fader bar is? It's how you activate the Death Star. I'm not kidding. Punch it into YouTube. When they activated the Death Star in Star Wars, the first Star Wars movie, it's a video shot of a control room a film shot. It's a film shot of a control room, and the guy's in his outfit, his costume. Activate the Death Star. And that's what he's using. He's using a T-bar, a manual fader bar on a Grass Valley switcher. That's a little bit of trivia. Okay. Uh, so you can also do a dissolve halfway through. You can do a dissolve halfway through, but it doesn't make a lot of sense. It doesn't make a lot of sense to do a dissolve halfway through because what you're going to wind up with is camera one at 50% power, full frame, camera two at 50% power, full frame. And so what it starts to look like is a morph. Does that make sense? It looks like you are dissolving into you. It's what we call a ghost. It's what we call a ghost. All right? So for combining camera shots, it would be kind of dumb. All right? But you can use ghosting to tint. You can use ghosting to tint. So let's say I need to darken an image a little bit. Right? I could mix in a little bit of a color. I could tint it. I can, can, I can tint it brighter. I can tint it darker. Does that make sense? So, you know, that's really what that's used for. So this is two very basic ways to combine video images. But I think what you guys want to know is how do you do it? How do you do these, you know, it, it looks much better than that. How do you combine video images in the fancy dancy way, right? Well, we're going to talk about one of those ways right now. We're going to talk about keys. We're going to talk about keys. Whoops. What is a key? What's a key? Nope. What is a key? Define key. Yep. A key is a video layer. A key is a video layer, period. A key is a video layer. Write that down 10,000 times. A key is a video layer. A key is a video layer, all right? So, who was asking about the key bus? Ah. When you select something in the key bus, you're selecting the source for the layer. When you select something in the key bus, that third row, you're selecting your key source. All right, so how many of you all have ever seen this? You've got a picture of an anchor, a camera shot rather, a camera shot of an anchor, it's a happy anchor. All right, camera shot of an anchor. And then the anchor's name pops up. Fred Friendly. Fred Friendly. Fred Friendly. You ever seen that? Yeah? Okay, so where is Fred Friendly coming from? Where are the words coming from? 
What machine is making those words? The graphics computer. Somebody sat down at the graphics computer in CG mode, right? And typed what? Fred Friendly. In the key bus, you have selected the graphics computer. All right. And everybody at home is looking at Fred here. Happy Fred. Happy Fred is on a camera. Does that make sense? Happy Fred is on a camera. So what's in program? Fred's camera is in program. Does that make sense? Fred's camera is in program. Let's say it's camera two. All right. Fred's camera is camera two. I'm going to activate the key. Fred's name, graphics computer, layers on top. Layers on top. So now everybody at home is seeing what? Camera 2 with the graphics computer layered on top. So now you're looking at two video sources at the same time. Make sense? Fred's camera, camera 2, is what we call the background. The graphics computer with his name, that's a layer, that is the key and they are independently controlled. The background is independently controlled from the key. All right, so if I wanted to, I could take camera two away and then bring up camera one. Does it still say Fred Friendly? Yeah, because I never took the key away. Does that make sense? Or I can take the key away, change it to something else, and bring it up. Make sense? But keys are independently controlled. Keys are independently controlled from the backgrounds. So are you looking at two video sources at the same time? Yeah, a graphics computer is a video source. All right? So in this example, you got a camera with the graphics computer keyed over. Now here's where the genius goes, all right? How many key layers can you have at the same time? Keep going. My switcher can do six on top of the background. So that's six key layers plus the background. How many video sources are you looking at at the same time? Seven. Seven separate things all at the same time. Each one independently controlled. Take away seven, take away three. Take away two, put three back. Put seven back. Each one's independently controlled. How many of you guys ever watch CNN headline news or MSNBC and there's all this junk on the screen, right? There's a picture of the anchor and the anchor's talking about something that happened in Houston and then up here in the corner you got the weather in Los Angeles. Down here you've got stock market stuff flying across the screen. Over here you got NFL scores from the weekend. Anybody ever seen all that junk all over the screen? Well, what do you think it is? Multiple, multiple key layers. Multiple graphics computers, but multiple key layers. Each one independently controlled. Right? So that's where it starts to get complicated. That's where it starts to get complicated is when you start adding in key layers. I'll see you guys uh, next week.